Tim, thank you so much for joining us here at Risk Mines. Thank you, it's great to be here. There's been an awful lot of discussion this week about regulation and the adoption of it. So what mm -hmm. are you seeing in terms of the models that are being um, looked at and, and what do you think the approach will be, particularly in terms of FRTB? Sure, there's a lot of debate between standard approach and internal model approach and I guess the decision depends on the complexity, the liquidity of individual portfolios. That's the obvious answer. But the bigger challenge is how do you get data to make that decision? You know, how do you, it's not a one and done type of decision where you're going to look at your existing portfolio and look at the availability of data to prove real price observations and liquidity and then make a decision. The markets are dynamic. What was traded last year may not be traded this year. So that dynamics uh, of the market really ensures that you, you have to have a lot of data in order to, to make those decisions. It's, the ROI is not once, once in time, but a continuous evolving process. So tell me about that data, because I think you've talked specifically about pooled data and, yes. and what results you're seeing from that. And I suppose, I suppose there's got to be a real quality of data too. You bet, you bet. So a lot of banks are making decisions based on the availability of data within their own trading book. So they don't have a wider perspective on the market. FRTB isn't about your own book, but liquidity in the market. So a lot of dealers have recognized the, the benefits of pooling to get maximum number of price observations. And there's no downside to pooling. So in our, in our tests, in a white paper, we've shown between 40 and 80% of non-modable risk can be reduced through pooling mechanisms. Obviously, every portfolio is going to be different. Every experience is going to be different. But there's, no, there's only upside to pooling. So I think that's one of the, one of the big uh, uh, strategies that banks are going to have in order to deal with FRTB. And they certainly need strategies, don't they? I mean, regulation is sort of changing all the time. We still don't have final confirmation on exactly what Basel's going to end up at. So how do, how do you guys mitigate for all of that? I think you'll see some very clear messages coming out of the Basel Committee with our final guidance. And the message is going to be, it's done. The framework is there. The committee will move from debating NMRF frameworks and sensitivities on risk into a consistent implementation across jurisdictions. So enough with the debate about the, the framework, how are we going to implement, how are we going to get ready. I think if we're here next year debating NMRF frameworks and there's any, any, any ambiguity in the markets, I think that's going to be a disservice for the, the market overall and the, the outcomes that Basel III sought to, uh, to pursue in the first place. So you're confident you guys will be able to move on soon? Well, let me put it this way. Um, you know, I live in America, it's hurricane season. So we usually have four days advance notice of a hurricane. You don't prepare for evacuation of a hurricane when it starts to blow. You, you prepare when it's sunny, you evacuate when it's sunny. Not to suggest FRTB is a hurricane. My point is, there's an advance notice, right? It's 22. I think any ambiguity would, would jeopardize that preparation. So there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of models to be approved, and, and, and now's the time to get started. So we, we, we think that there's going to be a very clear message sent by the Basel Committee that it's done, we're going to move forward with, a, with minor tweaks to the framework, but more or less the framework will, will exist as we see it today. Tim, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Great to talk to you. Appreciate thank you. Being here. Thank you.